They say only two things in life are certain, death and hack videos. And we are certainly not witnessing one of those today. Wait, which one? Grim Reapers and IRS agents, internet. My name is Perdium and welcome to five times Survivor Players Hack Challenges 9.0, the whole nine yards. The first hack on this list is from season seven, Pearl Islands, and it's one of the most unique creative strategies I've ever seen. In episode seven, we saw the infamous outcast tribe emerge from the jungle to rejoin the rest of the cast and compete against them in a challenge. If the outcast won this challenge, they would get to vote two people back into the game, but if they only beat one tribe, they would get to vote one person back. And if they lose, then they just go on their pre-jury trip. It's one of the most unique twists in Survivor history. The stakes were incredibly high, for the first time ever, players could come back into the game after being voted out. The challenge itself involved three parts. The first part was a quick run to the beach to grab the tribe flag and then run back to the three cages. Inside the cages were tied up tribe mates, so for the second part, the player who grabbed the flag had to then dig under the cages to get inside, untie their tribe mates to release them, at which point these tribe mates all had to dig under the next cage and so on. Part three of the challenge began in cage two, where the players had to fashion together a wobbly pole out of bamboo. They would use the pole to retrieve a set of keys that would unlock the second cage and then they would use the pole again to unlock the third cage by retrieving more keys that were even farther away. The first tribe to have all of their players escape the cages and touch their tribe mat would win. Now we've seen versions of this challenge before, but the creative strategy involved part three, when the players had to fashion together the wobbly pole of bamboo. Each tribe was given twine to tie the pieces together, but the twine itself wasn't strong. You had to weigh how much twine you might need to make the pole less wobbly, but the more twine you use, the more time you used, and this was a race. Now I don't know the exact rules for this challenge, what is and isn't allowed, they usually don't tell us that anyway, because the outcasts go on to win which makes for exciting TV, but what you may have missed is how they won. When the outcasts first emerged from the jungle, they were wearing these purple rags to identify them as the new purple tribe. Every tribe on Survivor has a certain buff with a tribe color. They exist to help identify to the audience who is on which tribe. So the outcasts weren't really a conventional tribe. They didn't have their own buff because they were made up of voted out players from the other two tribes. So the producers gave them a name and a tribe color and gave them purple rags of sorts to help distinguish them from the orange and the blue tribe. But when the challenge happened, we saw Lil and Trish use Use some of their rags to assist in keeping their wobbly pole a little less so. The twine was vital, but the tribe buff of sorts made their pole even more sturdy. This little maneuver happens so quickly that it's barely noticeable, but the amount of support that these purple rags gave their pole was likely a game changer. As we saw in the challenge, the Drake tribe was initially ahead of the outcasts, but when their pole fell apart in the third cage, they had to go back to the drawing board and apply more twine. The outcasts never had to do that. They built their pole once and that was enough. They took the lead and won the challenge. And while this is definitely a unique strategy with some quick thinking on the outcast part, I do wonder how fair it was given the other two tribes didn't have these rags. They did have buffs and clothing and maybe they could have used those streamers around the cages to help out. Each of the tribes had rags hanging around their cages that likely could have been used if they were thinking quickly enough. But the outcasts didn't use those either, so I don't know. I also want to quickly say that I had the pleasure of interviewing one of the outcasts on a personal call with Trish about this challenge, and she told me the producers never told them that they could or couldn't use those rags. They just thought it up on the spot. Ryan is through. The outcasts defeat Morgan and Drake. This challenge is over. The second hack is similar to another strategy that I've talked about in Survivor All-Stars. Players had to run across balance beams in a race to retrieve small flags. One tribe recognized how good Boston Rob was at navigating the beam, so the strategy came down to throwing your spot in the queue so Rob could continuously be given a chance to run the course. Every player ahead of him on his tribe would just jump off and accelerate his spot in line so that he could run again. It's a really great strategy that gave them the win, and if we fast forward to season 30, Millennials versus Generation X, we see it happen again. This challenge has three parts. Five players had to carry heavy sacks through an obstacle course and across a jagged balance beam. Once every sack was delivered, they could then be opened to reveal sandbags that would be used to knock down a puzzle. After every piece of the puzzle was knocked down, two more players would reassemble the puzzle to win the challenge. Any advantage to buy you time is gonna be worth its weight in bags of sand. And right away we see the Gen X tribe take the lead going up 2 to 1 in navigating the balance beam. But then CC on the Gen X tribe gets on the beam and 
everything slows to a halt. And this is where the strategy comes into play. Over on the Millennials tribe, Will beckons to Taylor, the guy who carried the first sack across, to come back and work on the next. Taylor was lightning fast, why not just have him do it again? So Figgy then makes her way across and ties up the game two to two, and then Taylor takes bag number three and just zips across. And then Michaela grabs the fourth Millennial sack and manages to score one more time, all while Cece is still slowly making her way across the beam. Legend has it, she still might be out there to this day. The Millennial tribe went from being down two to one to now being up four to two and Taylor then takes the fifth and final sack across to move on to the next part. Taylor carries three of the sacks for his team and increases their lead which allows the rest of the tribe to assemble the puzzle ahead of the Gen Xers. Is Taylor the millennial version of Boston Rob? Makes you think. Yes! 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 Do they have it? Come on! Yes! Yes! Millennial win! A beauty! Yeah! Continuing our conversation about Boston Rob, what is this, the Jeff Probst Hour? The third hack goes back to the attack zone I mentioned from Survivor All-Stars. Well, as many of you know, the attack zone originated three seasons prior in season five, Thailand, and was held over water, but the challenge itself was mostly the same. I've talked about this version of the challenge a lot as of late, how Sukjai broke a ton of rules and reduced their tribe to just Xi'an by the end of it, how they were in the lead for most of it, yet still managed to lose anyway. Did their crushing defeat all happen because they continuously broke the rules? Turns out, maybe. But the Chewigon tribe was also using a great strategy to maintain their pace, especially once they began to gain momentum. Unfortunately, while I don't think the attack zone is ever likely to return to our screens, I want to give a shout out to this fantastic defensive strategy used by Ted to prevent the opposition from making much ground. To provide some context, the challenge had players running across the beams to collect some items. If two players from opposing tribes met in the middle, they would square off in the attack zone where they would, you know, attack each other. If either player fell in the water, they would have to go back to the start, forfeiting the item they were holding. The first tribe to 10 points wins, and the purple Sukjai tribe took a commanding 8-4 lead. It was becoming a fast blowout, and Chewigon had to do something to prevent them from getting those final two points. Now, yes, this challenge is most infamous because Sukjai began to implode once they had this massive lead. They accidentally kept breaking the cardinal rule, you gotta have at least one foot in the attack zone when you first make contact. We see Ken, Rob, Stephanie, Jed, and even Penny all break the rules, which cost them a point. That said, while it was still 8-4, to four, Ted, the biggest guy on Chewigon, made his way across the beams and pulled off a great maneuver. He turned around. He didn't go to the other end and grab an item, which is what you were supposed to be doing. Instead, he kept his hands free and just played defense. Ted had already held his own against Rob earlier in the challenge, and now he was becoming a shield, preventing the other Sukjai from scoring. They had to get past him if they wanted to win. He is a wall that cannot be passed. If you pay close attention, you might notice that Penny can be seen watching Ted back up, and then Clay gets back to the middle with an item, and Penny is still just standing there totally defeated. Ted lets Clay pass, Penny then cheats in typical Sukjai fashion, but it doesn't matter. Ted's defense saved the day and kept Sukjai from staging a comeback after blowing a lead. Chewigon wins reward! The fourth creative strategy comes from season nine, Vanuatu, in episode eight, where the two tribes compete for a reward challenge right before the merge. This is a fairly common challenge in Survivor, where the players have to gather water from the ocean into a bucket and then dump the bucket into a bigger bucket. Once the bigger bucket is full enough, it'll lower, raising a flag. The first tribe to raise their flag or light the torch or whatever wins. The tricky part is that the person who fills up the first small bucket has to then toss it to a second tribe mate who then tosses it to a third and then a fourth and so on. So with every toss, the bucket loses water. A bad toss could ruin the entire chain and waste time. By the time the bucket gets to the final tribe there may be no water left. In some seasons, they just had to toss water from person to person instead of the bucket itself, but in Vanuatu, they had a hybrid. The bucket was tossed up until the final throw, at which point only water was thrown. And boy, did the player who was on the end get a whole lot of water thrown on them. For most of this challenge, the two tribes were equal until Rory realized he was totally drenched and basically standing in water. So what did he do? 
He took off his shoes and he emptied them into the bucket. That is a fair bit of water that he had in there. Likewise, throughout the challenge, he was also using his buff to both collect water and then squeegee it into his bucket. Of course, like all good strategies, his opponent noticed what was happening and then copied him. And despite Rory having a leg up with his shoes, it was Chris who prevailed in the end. Yeah! And it is! <laughs> But of course this challenge has been run so many times, so I looked at future versions of this challenge to see if it had ever happened again, and given Rory is such a game changer, I wasn't surprised to see it had. In season 13, Cook Islands, we saw Penner's wife Stacy use her shirt, at which point Ozzy's mom then copies her. In season 20, Heroes vs. Villains, we saw Russell's wife use her hair and even spit, interesting strat, as well as Rupert's wife Laura use her hair and shirt. On season 28, Kagian, Chaos Cast, well, before she became Chaos Cast, also also uses her shirt after Jatia gives her nothing. Which uh, may have been enough because the brains actually won this challenge. Either way, it has been a repeated strategy for years and kind of like Pearl Islands, if you can use your buff or your clothes or anything around you to get ahead, do it. Tomorrow you make your apologies. Today, you spit in your bucket. Yes, exactly. The fifth and final strategy is sticking with the pre-HD era for a challenge that's only ever happened twice, with only one player in the history of Survivor who has ever competed in it both times. I am talking about a challenge from both Season 6, The Amazon, and Season 8, All Stars. This was a challenge called Matchmaker, where the players were given a box with items in them. They had to ask another player from the other tribe if they had one of their items, they had to match each of the items in their box with another item from someone else's. It's basically the card game Go fish, but with like, you know, rocks and driftwood and seashells. Whichever tribe had the most pairings after all items were paired up was the winner. We saw the challenge first happen in the Amazon, but the editors kind of like fast forwarded through it, so it was difficult to keep track of every item and who was doing what. But in the second iteration, All Stars, a man who was at one point considered the greatest to never win Survivor by Jeff Probst, and may still hold that title depending on who you ask, Rob Sesternino pulled out a strategy that guaranteed his tribe, Shapera, would win this reward challenge. Rob metagamed the producers after seeing this challenge go down on his first season in season six, and so he knew they would be lazy and repeat their challenge setup. Rob told his tribe that all you have to do is ask the person to your left for any of the four items that you have. More than likely, that person would have what you're asking them for. So if Boston Rob asked Richard for a rock, Richard is likely gonna have a rock, and so on. Rob did say this strategy isn't 100% guaranteed, which to be fair it isn't, but it most likely would work out because he knew the producers had to have a setup that was simple for them to follow and would ensure each of the three tribes had even pairings across the board. For example, if you pause and look at what all these players had, Boston Rob had a rock, driftwood, sponge, and a shell. Richard, standing on Rob's left, had a rock, driftwood, sponge, and a coconut. Boston Rob had a 75% chance of getting it right so long as he asked Richard. Maybe the stats people out there could crunch the numbers, but as we see in the episode, Rob Sesternino's strategy proved to work, for the most part, for Shapera, even after Boston Rob ignored Rob C's strategy in the first round. <sighs> They never listen. The rest of Shapera continuously asked the people to their left for items, and in the end, Shapera won the challenge, all thanks to the man who knew it all. Boston well, Rob, he, 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 at first he starts asking other people, but then he gets with the program. He, he, I think he just doesn't want to listen to you at first, make it look like it was well, his own idea. And I tell these guys, ask the person on your left for the same wow. thing. Because for the most part, the most of the boxes are the same as the ones next to it. When they put the challenge together, it's easier to remember f when they're putting right. it together what is next what to each other. What? So for the most part, most of the boxes are s similar to the ones next to each other. The mastermind, now you know why we say you're the smartest person not to win Survivor. Yeah. All right, Sister Nino. Lex, do you have any coral? Oh, unbelievable. How are you guys doing this? And that's it for Survivor Hacks 9.0.
I have come to a massive appreciation for challenges and the strategies that go into them a lot more now after having looked into all of these moments. I hope you've all enjoyed these little quirks and who knows, maybe they will come in handy for some of you one day. A very big thank you to my patrons for all your support, for enabling me to just keep talking and talking and talking about Survivor. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to consult Lil about challenge advice on your way out and I will see you in the next one. Once I come to terms with the fact that if I were to ever play Survivor, I would more than likely get featured in a challenge fails montage than any of these videos. Tell me what to do, Reed. Try it up a little bit. There you go. Try that. Colby falls short. Sweet. You're doing good. Reed, I'm throwing it farther. Oh, okay. Now come on. We'll smooth it. Reed, talk to me for God's sake. Keep it straight. Uh, Reed. I did. I held it right there. Good. Smooth. He's been that way 34 days, Reed. Reed, tell me what you want. Just throw it, just throw it high. Come on, Reed, get it. Come on, Reed. <laughs>